Okay, we're going to go back to Revelation now. Revelation chapter 6. We departed for a few weeks as we celebrated Palm Sunday and then Easter last week. And so we're going to return now to Revelation in our study. And hopefully we will get through Revelation before the rapture happens. Which I don't know when. Actually, I hope that the rapture happens before we get through with Revelation. But we'll find out one way or the other. It's in God's hands. But Revelation chapter 6, we're going to read the whole chapter today. We're not going to discuss the entire chapter, but I want to give you kind of an overview of what's coming up here as we look at Christ opening the seals of the scroll that we talked about back in chapter 5 and then see where that leads us as we look into the rest of the book of Revelation. So we'll start at chapter 6, verse 1, and then read through the end of the chapter. The Bible says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. <clears throat> and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and that there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and I behold a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven is departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll look at God's word in, more in depth this morning. Father, we again come to you, and we ask that you would just help us to understand and teach us through your word. Lord, we acknowledge that your word is truth. And then as the truth, it is our authority for everything that we believe and everything that we do. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just guide us through your spirit today as we look into your word now in this chapter. And, Lord, help us to understand those things that you want us to know. Father, we trust you and we need you, not just to understand, but to live so that we can be acceptable in your sight. We need you as we worship you today, as we pray, as we give you praise. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be lifted up, that you would be glorified even as we look at your word now. Lord, use me as your instrument and fill me with your spirit and with your power. Give me your wisdom and let me speak your truth. Lord, that you might be honored, that you might be lifted up and glorified today, that your word might be spoken as you want it to be. And so, Lord, we just give you ourselves in this time for you to use as you please and for your work to be accomplished. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 
We have been studying through the book of Revelation. We're at chapter 6, but I want to take you back two chapters very quickly and just quickly review chapters 4 and 5. Remember, chapter 4 was John being ushered into the throne room of God, and there he saw the worship before the throne of God. And then in chapter 5, we were introduced to the Lamb, which we know as Jesus Christ in his glorified state. And the Lamb came forth from the midst of the throne, and he was worshipped as well, just the same as God was, because he is God. And John is there to witness that. And in the midst of this worship, remember, somebody says, who is worthy to open the scroll? We see the scroll in chapter 5 that's in the hand of God the Father. And no one from heaven or earth is worthy to take that scroll and to open it. That scroll being the title deed to the earth that was lost and usurped by Satan when he tempted man to sin. And so no one steps forward. And remember, in the end of John 5, John is weeping. But one of the elders comes forth and says to him, stop weeping because there is somebody that's worthy. And then Jesus Christ, the lamb, steps forward. And he's described as the lion of Judah. And when, when John looks to see the lion of judgment, he sees the Lamb of God who paid for the sin of the world. And that's where we left off in John chapter 5. Or I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 5. And so as we go into chapter 6, <clears throat> excuse me, hopefully my voice is going to last here this morning. But as we go into John chapter 6, Christ has the scroll in his hand. And John is still in this scene watching. And what we have here is the beginning of Christ opening this scroll. And it's got seven seals. And what we read in, John, in Revelation chapter 6 is the opening of six of those seals. When we get to chapter 7, there's a brief pause. And then in chapter 8, we see the seventh seal being opened. Okay? But these seals and this book or scroll that he's opening is the record of what God is going to do in reclaiming his authority on earth and the judgment that he brings on a sinful earth and a sinful mankind. Okay, and that's what we read about in Revelation, starting here at verse six, or chapter 6, all the way through chapter 19. It is the seven seals. Now, this is the judgment of God, and I want you to understand that. You saw a little bit of that as we looked at the, this chapter. You can see the earthquakes, the thunderings, the death, the famine, the pestilence, all the things that are going to come on the earth as part of God's judgment. And so you'll see those as God, as Christ opens these seals, another judgment is poured out and another judgment is poured out. So this, Christ, this seal, or I'm sorry, this scroll gives us the record of God's judgment upon the earth. So we'll go through these seven seals as we go through Revelation. But as you get to the seventh seal, then in the seventh seal, there are seven trumpets of judgment. And then as you go through the trumpets and you get to the seventh trumpet, then there are seven bowls or seven vials of judgment. And so it's just a record that keeps uh, escalating and compounding upon itself of God's judgment and God's wrath being poured out on the earth. And it starts, interestingly, a little bit, as we would put it, mild compared to what it's going to be. But by the time you get to the last sets of judgments that God is going to point, uh, that God is going to uh, pour out on the earth, we read toward the end of chapter 6 how men are just going to clamor for the rocks and mountains to fall on them because they can't stand before the wrath of the Lamb anymore. They would rather die than take God's wrath and God's judgment. And that's how bad it's going to be. So, as we start chapter 6, I want you to understand that most of the rest of the book of Revelation is the carrying out of God's judgment on the earth. It, it's all basically contained, these chapters between chapter 6 and chapter 19, is all fulfilled in the seven years of the Great Tribulation. And that's how great God's judgment is going to be. When you read, and as we read through this, you're going to understand, man, there's all kinds of stuff that's going to happen on the earth as God judges the earth. And as you look back in history, there is not at any time in history any kind of catastrophe and disaster that comes upon the earth like it does in these seven years. Okay, so that's the story that we're going to be reading. Now, interestingly enough, there are people who believe that 
God's judgment is past, that God's judgment is not real, that, you know, uh, you know man is, is okay. It's not going to be that bad. And I've talked to people, that, you know, when I try to witness to them, they're like, you know what, I don't care if I go to hell. I'll be down there with my buddies smoking and drinking and playing poker. And that's not what it's going to be like. And for people who will be alive during the tribulation period, that will be the, the greatest suffering that humankind has ever experienced on this earth. And yet that is just a drop in the bucket compared to hell. And so the judgment that God gives us in Revelation, all of these details and the agony and the suffering that the earth has to go through during that period is really a warning to us. He wants us to know this stuff, not to discourage us, but number one, to help us understand this is what we are spared from. No matter how bad your life is, it could be a whole lot worse, but God is going to spare us from this time of wrath if we trust in him. And number two, that those who end up going through this, hell is going to be a lot worse. So even if you have to go through this kind of suffering in your life, God is always the answer. God is the one who will bring us out of that. And so as we start chapter 6 here in Revelation, we need to keep that in mind. This message is for us as believers. Not just for us to know what's coming to the earth, because we're going to be gone. Okay, we see that as John is ushered into the, the, the uh, throne room of God in chapter 4, there's an open door. And there's elders, the 24 elders, they represent the church already in heaven. So the rapture has happened. Now we're starting, we're beginning the tribulation. John is seeing the tribulation take place starting in chapter 6 and through most of the rest of the book of, of Revelation. Okay? Now here's the fact. And this is the fact that God wants us to understand about this. This earth and all mankind are doomed for destruction. That's what we are destined to. Not because that's what God wanted for us when he created the earth and mankind in the beginning. But because of our sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, they sinned and brought the curse of sin upon the earth and upon all mankind after them. And therefore, the earth and mankind are all doomed for destruction in hell. Now, what we see in Revelation is the earthly physical part of some of that destruction and judgment. It's not the eternal judgment of God in hell. Okay, that'll be a whole lot worse. But the earth and mankind are all doomed. And there are many religions and there are many people who want to believe that, no, it's not that bad. Man is not that bad. In fact, there are many people who believe the earth is getting better. Now, look around. You want to disprove that theory that man and the earth are getting better? Turn on the news for five minutes. That's all it takes. And you can see the earth and especially mankind are not getting better and better. Man is not inherently good. Okay? There's nothing that can prove that. Now, man can do good things, but it's not from their own goodness. As Christians, we are called to good works, but that's not even our own efforts. That comes from the Holy Spirit that's in us. Without Him, there's nothing good. Okay? And Isaiah tells us that even our best deeds, our best good works, are as filthy rags in the sight of God. But there's many people who don't want to believe that. In fact, we all know about the theory of evolution. What does evolution teach? Evolution teaches that things progressively get better over time, right? We started off with a big bang, and then we had the cooling of all of these pieces that are floating around in space, and then on these pieces you had this primordial ooze that kind of appeared, and then out of that came life, and then through millions of years, life developed from a one-celled germ to look at us today, and look at what we've achieved because we've progressed so far. That's evolution. Okay, now we know that's not true. And if you believe evolution, then you should never take your car to the mechanic because your car should get better over time. And we know that's not the case. Okay, the car doesn't get better over time. The car gets worse. Try leaving your house go without maintenance for 20 years. See if it gets better. Okay, you'll be holding your umbrella up because the roof is going to be falling in on you. The walls will be collapsing. Things won't work. Things 
decay over time. That's the curse of sin. It's a principle that you learned in science, hopefully, called entropy. Entropy means things decay and get worse over time. If you don't believe that, look in the mirror. Okay? There's the best example of entropy. Okay? Take a picture of yourself from 20 years ago. Look at that and then go look in the mirror and tell me things are getting better. It's not happening, folks. Okay? I'm proof of that. I mean, I, that, I, I look in the mirror every day and go, man, I look old. Okay? I feel old. The evidence is there. So this whole theory of evolution or things getting better is not true. But that's what people want to hold on to. Why? Because God will cause them to believe a lie for those who reject him. They don't want the truth, and so they'll believe anything other than the truth. And here we have evolution. Now, even in Christianity, there is a belief called post-millennialism. That is the foundation of it, and what it teaches is this pr pretty much what evolution teaches. Not that the world itself is getting better, not that we evolved, but post-millennialism teaches that through the Christian influence, because Christians have the Holy Spirit in us, that's true, but through our influence, the world system, the philosophy of the world, will get better because we will influence it to the better. And they believe that Christ is not going to come back and destroy his enemies so he can set up his kingdom. They believe that Christianity is going to bring the world to such a good place so that Christ can basically just come back and set up shot and everything will be fine from then. Now again, I have a problem with that because if you look around at the world, the world is not becoming more Christian. The world is becoming farther and farther from God. They abandon truth. They reject truth. They don't want anything to do with God. I mean, you go even into our government. They're trying to banish God from all reference, even in government. It's been a long-standing tradition for them to open in prayer. There are many people in government who want to do away with that. And in fact, they now, instead of having a Christian come and pray to the God, they've had Muslims come, they've had Hindus come, they've had all different religions come and just offer a prayer to whoever, whatever God seems to be convenient for them. Okay? So, even though our influence should be strong in the earth and should show people Christ, the world is getting worse. They're, they're, they're going farther and farther and farther from God. Let me give you some examples of people in the earth. There's a man named Herman Kahn. Now, if you've been around for some time, you may recognize his name. He was a very prominent person back in the 70s and early 80s. He was the head of the Hudson Institute. That's a New York research organization that's dedicated to trying to predict the future. Now, not so much in a prophetic manner, but looking at the economic systems of the world, looking at you know, all of the, the government systems, all of the, the working foundations of our society, and then they predict certain things that will come out of that based on certain trends, okay? There was a man, Herman Kahn, he was the head of this institute for a long time. He wrote a book back in 1976 called The Next 200 Years, kind of celebrating the bicentennial of our country. And he was looking at the future of America based on the current situation in 1976. I'm not going to ask if you were alive in 76, okay, or how old you were. I was. I remember some things about the politics of, of 76, even though I was only like 11 years old. Um, but... Uh, that was, we had Jimmy Carter in office, okay? We had uh, problems in Iran. We had an energy shortage. Remember the lines, if you remember that far back, the lines waiting to get gas, okay? That was 1976. That was the, also the uh, bicentennial of our country. But he wrote this book called The two, Next 200 Years. And in it, he predicted that the population explosion in the world would soon just kind of fade out and that the world population would stabilize at about 10 billion people. That didn't happen, by the way. Um, he also said we would never run out of natural resources because there's vast supplies of natural resources that lie untapped in space and in the oceans. 
And he said, well, we have plenty of energy. We'll never run out of fossil fuels. And he thought we had enough fossil fuel to last the next 150 years, even at the rate at which it was consumed with the projected increase in that rate. Okay? So he thought, we don't have to worry about that. He, he predicted that pollution, all problems of pollution would be solved. And well, actually, his, his goal was 2176. That's about 50 years from now. Okay? This was 50 years ago. Well, 40 years ago. Okay, he predicted pollution would be solved. He said the inflation rate would drop below 5% and there would be a worldwide economic boom. He predicted that technology and genetic engineering would make food plentiful and cheap because we would develop new edible plants that could be grown in salt water. So you see the kind of person he is. Okay, very optimistic, looking toward progress and improvement in the future. This was almost 50 years ago he wrote this book. How much of that has happened? Okay, all we see in the news now is about energy shortages, economic crisis, food shortages, famine. Okay, none of this came true. But he believed because of mankind's ingenuity and innovation, we could solve all these problems on our own. It hasn't happened, folks. And if it hasn't happened in 50 years, I don't see it happening in, in the next 100 or 200 years. You're familiar with a man named Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller obviously was the special counsel that investigated the Russian collusion with President Trump. Before that, many years ago, he was the Assistant Secretary General to the United Nations. He was in charge of coordinating the work of specialized organizations and developing new world programs for the United Nations. And this is what he said 40 years ago. We are headed for a new age and a new world, a new genesis, a true global God-abiding political, moral, and spiritual renaissance to make this planet at long last what it was always meant to be, the planet of God. Now, do you see us moving closer and closer to becoming the planet of God now? I see less and less of God in our world than it was even 40 years ago. I've seen our society abandon God compared to when I was a young kid or even as a teenager. And you probably remember churches being full. I just had this conversation where on, a, on an average Sunday morning, churches were full. People in churches were building new buildings because they couldn't contain all the people that were in church. I just heard on the radio this last week, there, there was this report that there's this new, new version, of what they call new version of Christianity, where people are not in churches, but people consider themselves to be Christian because of their lifestyle, because of their morals or whatever, but church is not a necessity anymore. We're not getting better, folks. The world is getting worse. The morality is getting worse. Okay, we're moving farther and farther away from God. Now, I gave you all of that just because I want you to understand that that opinion is a minority opinion. Because that's what the Bible says. And as you read Revelation, especially as we look at chapter 6 of Revelation, we understand the world is headed for destruction and judgment because we are getting worse and worse and more and more sinful. Jesus said, it's going to be like in the days of Noah. That he, the, the end of time is going to come. People are going to wax cold in their love for God and for each other. They're going to do that which was right in his own eyes. That was a common phrase in the Old Testament. That is common in our society. Everybody is out to protect themselves, to do what's right for them, and they don't care who they step on in the process. That is our world that we live in. But what's the goal? Even as people try to acknowledge that, Everybody still wants a better earth, a peaceful earth, a better system, a better world. Get rid of hunger, get rid of economic problems, get rid of inequality. Okay, you hear that all the time. But how is that solved? Everybody has a different opinion of how that's going to be solved. The problem is everybody wants a better earth for themselves, regardless of what it costs other people. And most people will look for a better life for themselves, even if they have to step on other people. And that's the trend of our society. So for all those people who think the world is getting better, and people are getting more good, and more improved in our demeanor, and in our 
uh, nature. Again, pick up a newspaper or watch the news for 10 minutes. It's not happening. And Jesus said, Matthew 24, verses 10 through 12, many shall be offended. He's talking about this end of time that we are approaching. He says, many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, if I was a prophet and trying to interpret prophecy specifically, I would say, I think that's talking about the last election we just had. Okay? Many shall be offended, and they shall betray one another, and hate one another, and false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But that made itself manifest in a difficult election, because that is the nature of the people that are involved. And that includes all of us. Now, we can say, well, I'm accepted to that because I'm a believer. Only by the grace of God are we the exception. And unfortunately, I've known a lot of people who call themselves believers in my lifetime who fit that description. Because they didn't trust and live by and submit to God's authority and let the Holy Spirit produce His work in their lives. They wanted to do their own version of Christianity on their terms. And so that's what they look like. Now, this, if this is how Jesus describes how the world would be as we near the end times, then we can't believe things are getting better. Things are getting worse. We know things are getting worse, just as Jesus said they were. And because everything is getting worse, and because man is becoming more and more sinful and not less sinful, then the result of that is certain judgment. Because God said he has to judge sin. God's justice will not let sin go unjudged. And so God will judge sin. Now, he does that on a small scale, in a limited way, in our lifetimes now. And the world has felt the effects of God's judgment on sin in, in small ways through its history. But when we get to the tribulation, there's no holds barred. The doors will be thrown open and God's wrath will be poured out on the earth like the earth has never experienced before. That's what Revelation is. That's why it's called the Apocalypse. Because it's about God's judgment. And so the truth is this. Because of the, sin, the curse of sin that was brought upon the earth and upon all mankind, every single one of us and this earth is headed for certain destruction. Now, the hope we have as believers is that we'll be spared that because we trust Christ to deliver us from that destruction, from that judgment. So that's the good news. We saw that in Revelation when we were in chapter 3, looking at some of the churches that were faithful in following Christ. Church of Philadelphia in chapter 3, verse 10. This is what Christ said about them. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience... I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Christ said, if you are faithful, even in a sinful world, even among sinful people who may even be inside the church, if you are faithful, Christ says, then I will deliver you from the wrath to come. Now, that wrath that he talked about, he says to, that are, that's going to try them that dwell upon the earth. That wrath, in a very specific way, is talking about this period of tribulation in the Great Tribulation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 has the same message for us. In, in verses 9 and 10, Paul says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath. Definite article in the Greek means it's a specific event. This is talking about the great tribulation, I believe. God will deliver us from that if we believe in him. Now, we don't know when that's going to start. We don't know when Christ is going to come in the clouds and take his church up to heaven. It could be today. Okay, it could be now. I hope. No. Well, we're still here. Okay? It could be a hundred years from now. We don't know. But we have to be faithful. 
And Christ says, whether you live or whether you die, if you're faithful, you will be delivered from that judgment. Now, in a general sense, those who are already dead, they're spared that judgment. But they will be spared the greatest judgment in hell as well and separation from God for eternity. But in a short-term sense, if we live to see the tribulation in our lifetime, number one, as Christians, we won't be here because God will deliver us from that period of time, from that wrath. But it's coming. It's coming. The hope we have is that we're going to be delivered from it. For others... They're going to get what they deserve. No one has gotten what they deserved yet. But it's coming. God will judge all the earth and all sinners in it. And this is not going to be a slap on the wrist type of judgment. This is going to be an all out, full scale, feel the wrath of God in your life and on the earth. And it's going to begin in earnest at the beginning of the tribulation. And it's going to escalate for seven years from that time until it's so bad on the earth that as we read in Revelation 6 today, at the end of that chapter, that men are going to call for the rocks and the hills to fall upon them because they cannot stand before the wrath of the Lamb and the one who sits on the throne. And so the great tribulation is the final pouring out of God's wrath upon all the earth and upon all who are in it. And as we begin in Revelation chapter 6, we see the beginning of that seven-year period. This, as Christ opens this first seal, this is the beginning of that seven-year period, as John relates to us what he's been shown. And then as we go through the rest of the book, we're going to see it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Until finally, Christ comes back. And when Christ comes back at his second coming, when he comes to the earth and his feet touch the ground on the earth, woe to them who are not followers of him. Because when Christ comes back the second time, he will destroy everyone who is against him at that point. And that will be the final element of his wrath on this earth. No one will be left standing who is not a believer in Jesus Christ when he comes back the second time. Now, as bad as all that sounds, and I wanted to give you this overview of what the tribulation is going to be and the judgment of God and how bad it's going to be during that time, I want you to look at the first seal, okay? Because Christ is opening the seals here in chapter 6 of Revelation. And we're going to take just a couple minutes to look at this first seal because here's the great irony of the great tribulation and of God's wrath. Verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I want to point out a couple things in these verses. Number one, in verse 1, when, he, when the, the seal is opened, and remember, one of the beasts, that's the four cherubim, the four beasts that were before the throne of God. That's who he's talking about here. In the original manuscripts, the angel does not say, or the cherubim does not say, come and see. He's not talking to John here. The word in the Greek is just come. Okay, the and see was added by translators. But the original text says, come. In the Greek, or what it means is, come forth. Okay? Not come and look. It means come forth. And he's not talking to John because John's already seeing this. He's talking about what's going to happen in the first seal. And what we see in verse 2 is this white horse. Now, you may be familiar with the phrase, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is where it comes from, right here in Revelation chapter 6. The first four seals are four horsemen that are revealed and that come out upon the earth. And in verse 2, he says, I saw and behold the white horse. This is the first horse. He that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, when you see this symbolism of a white horse, we've talked about this before. Remember on Palm Sunday, Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And I explained that as conquering kings came back or as they would enter into their home or capital city, they would come on a white stallion signifying victory. And many times they would lead this parade of prisoners behind them. Okay? But the picture here is someone on a white horse. And it says he has come to conquer 
and conquering at the end of the chap at the end of the verse. But his description in the middle says, he, sat on, he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. So what we have here is an introduction of the Antichrist. Okay? This is what's going to happen in the first part of the, the Great Tribulation. The Antichrist will be revealed. It's talked about many places in Scripture where the son of perdition or that man of wickedness. The Bible uses several different names, but it's talking about the Antichrist. And this is the revelation or the revealing of the Antichrist right at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, it's interesting that he has a bow, but no arrows. That means he has power, but it's not military power yet. That will come. But when he comes to power, it's not going to be because he conquered many nations. And then the next phrase says, he was given a crown, or the crown was given to him. He didn't fight for it. He didn't battle over it. He didn't kill the previous king. It was handed to him. And so the symbolism that we have is when the Antichrist comes at the beginning of the tribulation, it will be in peace. And there's the great irony of the whole great tribulation is right here in the first seal is that peace is the first thing that is so-called revealed to the world or that the world experiences in the great tribulation under the judgment of God. Now, why does that make sense? To us, it may not. But when you look back through Israel's history, Israel, all they wanted was for God to give them peace, for God to give them prosperity, for God to bless their lives, for God to give them all the promises as a chosen people that he had given them. And so they were always looking for peace. In fact, that's what you want. That's what most people want in the world today. You will find that people want peace. They go about it different ways, but the end goal, we want peace. We want reconciliation. That's what the Antichrist brings is peace. But it's a false peace. All through Israel's history, you'll see this in, in the prophets, especially in, uh, in, in Jeremiah. God condemns Israel and Israel's leaders especially because they're proclaiming peace, peace, but there is no peace. And yet, at the very beginning of the tribulation of the worst of God's judgment, it begins with a seeming period of of peace and this man who is a great peacemaker and that's how the world is going to accept the Antichrist as bad as he will get because in their eyes he is in a sense the Messiah who's going to bring peace to the earth you wonder why Israel is going to fall for that ruse how can they believe the lie about the Antichrist we've been studying Daniel and in Daniel chapter 9, it says when he comes, he's going to make a treaty with them, a peace treaty for seven years. And so this Antichrist will accomplish in Israel what Israel has been trying to accomplish ever since they began their existence as a nation. They've been fighting since the beginning of their creation. I mean, they were slaves in Egypt. That's how they started out as a nation. They came into Canaan, the promised land, and they ended up fighting. And then you have the, the judges, and then you have the kings, and you have all of these people that lead Israel. And the whole history of Israel is defined by wars with other people and other nations. Now, part of that was because they didn't get rid of the people that God told them to get rid of. And so God let those people continue to persecute Israel. But their whole history is marked by persecution and war. That is the history of Israel. Even since 1948, they have not had any year in which there was not some kind of animosity shown toward them as far as military aggression. And especially in just the communications that other countries make. I mean, there are Arab nations that would be happy if they were just annihilated and off the face of the earth. But here we have a man who not only promises them peace, but delivers it. Now, under President Trump, we saw several Arab nations come to peace agreements with Israel. Okay, I'm not saying Trump is the Antichrist. Okay, what I'm saying is we have the steps already in place. We have that, that uh, path already in motion. But this guy, the Antichrist, is going to come in and establish peace like Israel has never known before.
And he is not going to be the enemy of Israel at the beginning of the tribulation. He is going to be the great peacemaker. And that's why they will look at him as the Messiah. Because we, as we read this morning in Isaiah, he is the Prince of Peace. And so they will think, in their unconverted minds, in their rebellion toward God and wanting it their own way, Here's the great peacemaker. He must be the Messiah. That's why he's called the Antichrist. Because he comes in looking like what Christ looks like to them. And he gives them that national security. He gives them that military defense system that defends them against enemies. And in fact, if you read in the prophets, especially uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, Israel is going to be in such a peacetime that they will basically lay down their weapons and not feel like they have any need to fight at all. They don't have to defend themselves at all because this guy's going to do it for them. And that's what we see at the beginning of the tribulation. And there's the great irony. At the beginning of the worst judgment of God poured out upon the earth, you have this period that's initiated by so-called peace. But it's a false peace. And that's the important thing to remember. It's a false peace. God uses this false peace, again, to get Israel's attention. Now, when we looked at the tribulation a couple of weeks ago, and I did an overview of the tribulation, I said there's two purposes. <clears throat> Number one, to bring Israel back to God. Okay, and that's going to happen at the end. Israel will repent, and all Israel will be saved. Romans 11 says that. But also to judge the Gentile nations who have rejected God. Now, it's a judgment against Israel, though, because of their rejection. And it's through this judgment that God is trying to get their attention to bring them back to him. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, says this, Alas, for that day is great, talking about this end time period of tribulation. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Even, it is even to the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Talking about this time of tribulation, it is called Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. It is specifically to judge Israel, but to bring them or purge them, as we see in the book of Daniel, to make them turn back to God. And the remnant that will believe are the ones who will be delivered at the end of the great tribulation. But that's God's purpose. He's going to purge Israel. He's going to judge them for their unbelief and for their rebellion and disobedience. And this judgment here in the Great Tribulation is going to be the ultimate of all of that. Okay? Now, we've been studying in Daniel. We've seen the timeline. The angel has revealed to Daniel in several chapters this timeline of judgment that God is going to bring upon Israel specifically. Okay? And in chapter 11, cha the earlier chapters talk about Babylon. That's the first kingdom that seriously oppresses and brings judgment upon Israel. And then after that, in chapter 11, the, the uh, angel explains to Daniel there's going to be Persia. And there's going to be Greece. And then he goes from Greece and he jumps all the way to the end time, the 70th week of Daniel, this week or seven years of Great Tribulation, which is the extension of the Roman Empire. That's the fourth kingdom. So it's all about the judgment that's coming on Israel. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. God's judgment upon Israel and understanding the time frame and how that works. So God uses all of that judgment. But at the end of the tribulation, the Bible tells us that all Israel who are left will be redeemed. That's God's ultimate purpose in it. In Jeremiah 31, let me just share with you this because this passage is referred to as the New Covenant. This is the giving of the New Covenant. You thought it started in the New Testament. It actually is given to Israel in Jeremiah 31. In verses 6 through 11, this is what God says, For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. This is saying, Israel is going to say, We need to return to God. Verse 7, For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob. Shout among the chief of the nations, publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. This is referring to those who will be saved at the end of the tribulation. Verse 8, Behold, I will bring from them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither, and they shall come with weeping, 
and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather them, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Now look at verse 11, if you're there. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. God will redeem Israel at the end of the tribulation. But the purpose of all the judgment is to judge them for their sin. So that they will turn and repent. Okay? And so God tells us exactly what's going to happen during the tribulation. Great judgment is going to be poured out. Many of Israel, in fact two-thirds, will die. But the remnant will be gathered and all of them will repent and seek the Lord. Okay? And Daniel tells us the purpose for all this suffering is to purge Israel. In, in chapter 11, verse 35 in Daniel, he says that. To purge them, to make them white. So it's through the turmoil of the Great Tribulation that God will bring back the remnant of Israel to himself. But here's the point. God has to prove during this time that peace is only found in him. See, Israel's been looking for peace everywhere else, but not in God. Peace can only be found in God. I mentioned how in Jeremiah, God condemns Israel's leaders because they proclaim peace, peace, but there is no peace. Those are God's words. And God punished them for it. And it's going to be the same in the Great Tribulation. At the beginning of that time, Israel is going to welcome in this guy, this Antichrist that we see in Revelation 6 2, as a peacemaker. And they're going to be deceived into thinking they found the Messiah of peace, the Prince of Peace. Here he is. He's going to have the solution, not just for Israel's peace, but for world peace. You know? That's global peace. One guy. It's going to happen at least in their eyes on the surface. But it's not real peace. And because people believe they found peace in a person or in a system, it's all going to fall apart very quickly. Because people cannot bring peace. Earthly circumstances cannot bring peace. Peace is only found in God. So first he judges Israel to show them where true peace is found. And they realize that at the end. But he's also going to judge all the world. Because they're trying to find peace apart from God as well. I mean, isn't that what a atheism is? There is no God, but I can still have peace. I can make this world a better place through the efforts of humanity. If we all treat each other as we should, the world can become a better place. The problem is whenever you use or claim moral virtue apart from God, it's nothing but dirty rags in God's sight. And so the Gentile world has the same problem. In fact, in Isaiah 57, God describes them like this. In verses 20 and 21, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. The world is going to think they have found peace in the Antichrist. It's not going to be that way for very long. In fact, in Isaiah 34, I'm going to quickly read this for you, verses 1 through 8. We saw the description of the judgment against Israel, as I just read. But in Isaiah 34, God talks about the judgment against the Gentiles. In verses 1 through 8, he says, Draw near, O nations, to hear and listen, O people. Let the earth and all contains here and the world and all that springs from it. For the Lord's indignation is against the nations and his wrath is against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out. Their corpses will give off a stench and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. And I can continue reading. It's all basically the gory details of God destroying all of the military might of the world. And in verse 8, he says, For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. That is the mount of God where Christ will rule. 
So there is no peace for the world. But at the beginning of the tribulation, everybody's going to think they've found the answer to that. And that's how the Antichrist is going to gain power and influence so quickly. Because he offers peace. And he's going to proclaim peace, peace, but there is no peace. And at the end of the tribulation, as we'll see as we get into chapters 19 and 20 of Revelation, when Christ comes back the second time, he will destroy all his enemies. In fact, the Bible talks about him trampling them. And we'll see in Revelation that someone points and says, as they're looking at the Son of God after he's trampled his enemies, as he goes up the Mount of Olives, as he sits on the throne of David, he says, look, your robes are stained. And he says, yeah, that's the blood of my enemies who I just trampled. There's not going to be anyone standing that doesn't believe in Christ and that's not a follower of his at the end of the tribulation. He will destroy them all. And when he finishes destroying all of his enemies, he will set up his throne in Jerusalem and all people, both Jew and Gentile, will bow before him as the king of the entire earth and the king of the entire universe. And they will say, all power and glory and praise be to the Lamb, like we read in chapter 4 and 5. Now that will be a literal, physical, earthly fulfillment of Philippians chapter 2. In verses 9 and 11, when it says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus Christ, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess, I'm sorry, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That will literally happen at the end of the tribulation when Christ sets up his kingdom. Because no unbelievers will be left alive. And so the great tribulation will purge the earth of sinners. Not of sin yet, because the curse still is there. But all sinners who have not been redeemed will be gone. And we know, as we'll see in Revelation chapter 20, at the end of Christ's 1,000 year reign on earth... There will be another revolt when Satan is loosed and he will gather together a great host from the inhabitants of the earth who will have been born during that thousand year reign of Christ who outwardly conformed but inwardly rebelled and here's their opportunity to overthrow this righteous religious tyrant Jesus Christ who makes them do all these things and that's going to be the last battle because Christ will consume them with fire from heaven it says and then Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire forever. And that will be the end of it. And then the Bible tells us this earth will be consumed with a great heat. Second Peter tells us. It will be destroyed. So it's not just the people that are doomed. It's the physical earth. Because it has the curse of sin in it. And God has to rid his universe, his world of sin. Second Peter tells us in chapter 3 and verses 10 through 13, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up. And then Peter says, seeing that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? Where's our focus? How should we live? Where do we look for peace? Systems of the world? A great leader who is great at making peace treaties? Peace is only found in God. That's the message of the great tribulation. And it's revealed right here in this first seal when Christ opens it up. The Antichrist comes forth on a white horse. He doesn't have to conquer. He's handed the crown. He's put in authority. He brings peace to the world, a false peace, and very quickly it falls apart and then God's judgment rains down in full. Judgment comes before jubilee. Tribulation comes before tranquil tranquility. 
Purging comes before peace. Now we know the thousand years of Christ's reign on earth, the millennial kingdom, that will be a time of great peace. The Bible describes that for us. But that's because it's found in Christ. Now we don't have to wait to find peace until the millennial kingdom of Christ. We already have the Prince of Peace available to us. People who will be punished, who will be judged, who have to go through that judgment, they don't want God's peace. They want their own version of peace. But you can't get it. And so they will experience judgment, tribulation, purging, except for those who have found their peace and reconciliation in Christ before that all starts. See, that's the hope we have. This morning we were reading in, in uh, Romans. We're studying Romans in, in Sunday school. And we were in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 starts like this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the source of peace. There's the Prince of Peace. As we began this morning, I read for, from, uh, for you from Psalm 29. Psalm 29 ends in verse 11. It says, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Peace can only be found in God. It's not going to be found in circumstances. It's not going to be found in fixing problems. It's not going to be found in peace treaties. It's not going to be found in having your life ordered and organized. It's only found in God. Now, on the grand scale, when we look at the Great Tribulation, to avoid judgment, obviously, we need to find peace in Jesus Christ for that. But what about in the short term? Why do Christians struggle with a lack of peace in their lives when we have the Prince of Peace as our Savior? There's no reason for us not to have peace. A pandemic shouldn't change that. A global economic crisis Shouldn't change that. If great earthquakes come and the mountains start falling apart before we are taken to heaven, we shouldn't lose our peace because it's not in this world. It's not in our circumstances. It's not in people. It's not in government. It's not in leadership. It is in Christ. And if we already have Christ, then you already have the source of peace. Galatians 5 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, joy peace. Peace can only be found in God. In almost every single one of his epistles that Paul wrote that we have for us in scripture, he includes in those epistles this greeting, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Because it's only found in Jesus Christ. He knew that. And he knew that there's no peace apart from God. He tried to find that peace apart from God for a long time until God shook his world. And he saw the truth. And so if you want peace, as a believer even, it's not going to be found in anything in this world. Any one, any system, anything, that's false peace. That will be destroyed. That's all going to be gone. And so the question is, if we can't find peace in God now, how are we going to find peace in Him when the judgment comes? If we struggle with peace, it's because we're looking at what's around us. Who's around us? We don't have our eyes on the Prince of Peace. That's what this first seal reminds us of. False peace will deceive a lot of people. But as believers, we should not fall into that trap. Find peace in Christ. Not just in salvation, but for everything in your life. Because he's the only answer. Now let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us and you've provided a way for us to find peace through Jesus Christ. And we know that your definition of peace is different from ours. And so help us to change our thinking, to be more in conformity with what the truth is, what true peace is that's found in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take our eyes off of our circumstances and off of people, off of government, 
off of all the other things that may deceive us into thinking we have peace so that we can focus on you, so we can focus on what you want for us and the peace that you can bring in our lives even now, and especially the peace that we will have as your judgment falls upon the earth and in that eternal judgment that we will be spared from because we've been reconciled in peace through Jesus Christ and his blood on the cross. Lord, help us to remember the peace that you can give and the peace that passes all understanding that we can only find in you. And so help us to be faithful in that, to show the peace to others, to help them to find that peace in you as well, so that you might get the glory and honor in everything that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.